Welcome to Heian Haven. I'm Dawn. Today we're discussing the first chapter of the Tale of Genji, Kiritsubo, or the Polonia Pavilion. Let's start with a summary, shall we? In a certain reign, whose can it have been, someone of no very great rank, among all his majesty's consorts and intimates, enjoyed exceptional favor. The Heian equivalent of Once Upon a Time. We will call this lady of no very great rank, Kiri Tsubo, as she lived in the Polonia Pavilion. Kiri means Polonia. The emperor loved her deeply and lavished attention upon her to the exclusion of all the others. The hate heaped upon her makes her health fragile. They have a son. He is a magnificently beautiful child, a jewel, and instantly becomes his father's favorite. This angers the Kokiden consort, the highest ranked among the emperor's ladies and the mother of his firstborn son. Kiritsubo is treated with enmity by the other ladies. Trash is thrown in her path and she's locked in hallways. Her health remains poor. The emperor provides his newest son with a ceremony equal in grandeur to his firstborn's event and further fans the flames of hatred. After years of constant misery from the other women, Kiritsubo takes a turn for the worse. Near death, she is finally allowed to leave the palace and dies just after midnight. The three-year-old prince is sent to his grandmother for the mourning period. Having received word that his young son's guardian had fallen into despair and her home into disrepair, the emperor sends an invitation for Kiritsubo's mother to bring his son and join him at the palace. She eventually sends the young prince to his father and dies the next spring. Previously, the young prince would have split his time between the palace and his grandmother's home. He was now in residence at the palace, and the emperor gives him the Polonia Pavilion, or Kiritsubo, for his apartments, and the ladies who waited on his mother now wait upon the boy. As the young prince grows, he increases in beauty and charm. Now seven, he's gifted in his schoolwork and an accomplished musician. Even the Kokiden consort warms to the boy. After consulting physiognomists, a person able to judge character from the facial features or predict the future, and astrologers of the Japanese and Indic traditions, and considering the boy's lack of maternal support at court, the emperor decides to make his son a commoner by giving him a last name, Genji or Minimoto. Years pass. Genji is now 11. The emperor has been searching for another lady who looks like his lost love. He is told of a woman of high rank, a princess, who bears a striking resemblance to Kiritsubo and seeks her out. She is installed at the Wisteria Pavilion and is called Fujitsubo. The emperor keeps Genji by his side, even in the quarters of his intimates. Fujitsubo, only 16, is reluctant but acquiesces to the emperor's request and allows Genji through her curtains. Genji is fascinated by the woman who he is told resembles his mother and brings her gifts and develops a strong affection for his father's youngest consort. The Kokiden consort resents her rival and renews her disdain for Genji. Genji is now 12, and his father gives him a coming-of-age ceremony even more fancy than his older brother's, the heir apparent. The minister of the left, who served as sponsor for Genji's coming-of-age, has arranged with the emperor to marry Genji to his daughter, called Aoi. She is four years older than Genji, and not thrilled by the match. Her brother, called Tono Chujo, becomes fast friends with our prince. Genji wishes to be married to someone like Fujitsubo instead and spends the majority of his time in service at the palace rather than at home with Aoi. Let's compare the translations. I'm reading the five translations in order of publishing date. Suematsu is first. I like it. In particular, I'm fond of the use of Japanese for titles. I've also become fond of the various voices of the volunteers that read the LibriVox recording. Whaley comes next, and I must say I was pleasantly surprised. I expected to not like Whaley, I expected his old-fashioned language to be off-putting. It's not. There's something kind of charming about Whaley, and perhaps the antiquated language helps you buy into the fairy tale quality of the first chapter. The poems are a little hard to pick out. They appear the same as dialogue within the text. Seidenstecker provided me with a not-so-pleasant surprise. I didn't really like it. It felt a little choppy and stilted. The sentences are broken up in an almost percussive manner. On the upside, the poems are set off from the text, and one can at least recognize all of them easily. Just because I didn't like it as much doesn't mean I didn't get anything out of it. Now for Tyler. Tyler was lovely. The sentences flow freely. The poems have movement and the footnotes. I adore his footnotes. The snatches of poems, the fragments that the characters are so apt to quote, are actually explained. 
He includes a list of characters with their relationships at the front of the chapter and explains the chapter title as well. The references are clearly pointed out. It's fantastic. Hands down my favorite. And finally, Washburn. Not bad. The flow was better than Seinstecker, but he has a tendency to veer toward the verbose. The information Tyler puts in footnotes, Washburn tries to adapt into the text itself with varying degrees of success. He is not as eloquent as Whaley, but being able to listen to this version with its singular narrator puts me in the mind of a lady of the court who would listen as someone else read the tale. There were three differences in the translation that stuck out to me. The first is a minor quibble. The emperor has stayed up waiting for a messenger to return. He retires to his room at the hour of the ox. Suematsu gives us 5 a.m. Washburn after one in the morning, Seidenstecker one or two in the morning, Whaley, the hour of the bull in a rare footnote lists 1 a.m. and Tyler roughly two to 4 a.m. I've included a link in the description to a webpage explaining how the Japanese kept time in the past. The second inconsistency is a difference in which character performed an action. When Kiritsubo's health is in final decline, someone begs for her to be allowed to return home. In four of our five translations, the person making the tearful entreaty is Kiritsubo's mother, but Washburn translates it as Kiritsubo begging to leave. I expect that we will find divergences like this throughout the tale. Because the characters are not called by personal names, and indeed rarely any appellation at all, it is no simple thing for our translators to figure out which character is being referred to. In instances like this, I'm inclined to defer to the majority, especially since the text mentions that she had already asked to leave and was denied. And now for the third. This one is more delicate. Maybe the differences are more stark. The emperor's relationship with Kiritsubo is frequently compared to that of Chinese emperor Zhuo Zhong and his own low-ranking concubine Yang Guifei in the Song of Unending Sorrow. The Chinese emperor was so enthralled with Yang Guifei that he neglected state affairs to the point of rebellion and was forced to execute his love. Our emperor becomes obsessed with the tale after the death of Kiritsubo. Our translators describe a painting of Yang Guifei very differently. Suematsu says, but the style was after all Chinese. Weili, the lady in the painting, was all paint and powder and had a simpering, Chineseified air. Seidenstecker, no doubt she was very beautiful in her Chinese finery. Tyler, the face was no doubt strikingly beautiful in its Chinese way. And Washburn, her Tang style attire was unquestionably vivacious. I find Whaley's choice of the word simpering distasteful. It has an ick factor for me, and combined with the rest of the sentence, it feels both anti-woman and anti-Chinese. The rest of our translators get across that the Chinese style was falling out of favor, and they all express the sentiment that the painting lacks the spark of life. Moving on, let's discuss seasonal references. Despite the number of years we move through in the first chapter, at least 12, our seasonal references are fairly sparse. Spring gets two mentions, appointment of the heir apparent and the death of Genji's grandmother. We're given a bit more substance for autumn. It is in the fall, during typhoon season, that the emperor sends Miyobu to Genji's grandmother. We're told of the chilly autumn wind and reminded that with all the sadness, it was a very dewy autumn do being a common poetic reference to tears. Both references serve to enhance the melancholy of the scene. Autumn was not all doom and gloom, not usually. The moon is particularly lovely and moon viewing parties are typical, but not so much in the palace following Kiritsubo's death. The Kokiden consort, showing no regard for the grief of the emperor, is said to be making the best of the beautiful moon by playing music far into the night. This was the same night that Miyobu was sent in an effort to fetch Genji and his grandmother. Let's talk about color and clothing. Our first clothing reference comes from Kiritsubo's harsh treatment. Filth or trash was strewn in her path that fouled the hems of Kiritsubo's gentlewoman. To give you an idea what this means, you can see by the image that this is not as simple as say, your skirt hem getting dragged in the mud. There are a lot of layers here. Hitue, five or more ginu, inuchigi, and the mo. This is potentially almost a dozen garments getting messed up for each lady in waiting, and every garment is taken apart to be laundered. There are a lot of work to clean. I've made some of these garments with a sewing machine, which they did not have, and by hand. It takes a while to sew one of these together by machine, much less a dozen by hand. It was a dirty trick to play on someone. The next mention of a garment is a ceremony. 
Genji's donning of the trousers, baby's first hakama. I believe in modern Japan that this happens at five. And now we need to take a moment to talk about gifts. Gifts, at least so far in the tale, are generally presented by someone of rank to a person of lesser rank. We have a few examples in this chapter. Before Miyobu leaves Kiritsubo's mother in her gloomy garden, the elder woman sends gifts out, mementos of her daughter. Miyobu is given a set of gowns and hair accessories, combs or hairpins. The gowns were likely a set of the middle layers of the many worn. Presenting a set of women's gowns is a very common gift as we see it repeated in this chapter and as we move through the novel. After Genji has had his hair cut in his coming of age ceremony, he changes into the robes of a man and has his hair tied up under a new headdress. It may have looked something like this. The minister of the left, as Genji's sponsor, is presented with a number of things, including a set of women's robes and an oversized uchiki in white. An uchiki is the uppermost robe worn by these women. The lady on the right has an uchiki in red, and the lady on the left has a cream-colored uchiki. White is the color of ritual purity. It's also the color worn when princes are born. Tyler tells us that the garment would have been resized for use. Most likely, this means it would have been taken apart and put back together with larger seam allowances rather than cut down. Gifts are also presented to everyone in attendance, and there are even chests of cloth meant for the lower servants. The garments worn at court were exclusively silk, even for the retainers, the gentlewomen, and ladies-in-waiting. Everyone was wrapped in yards and yards of it. One of the most gratifying parts of reading this chapter was validation that my idea to read several translations at once would maximize my understanding. I really do feel like I've gotten into the text further than I could have while reading a single translation. In its richness and variety, the tale of Genji rewards not only reading, but rereading. Greater familiarity with it reveals new depths. What stood out for you in this chapter? Let me know in the comments. Thank you for watching. Join me next time for chapter two, Haha Kiki, the broom tree. Subscribe if you'd like to explore the Han period of Japan with me through the tale of Genji.